The Incapate Club podcast is intended for mature audiences. I know we're usually talking about kids' cartoons and stuff, but there's going to be naughty language. Uh, anyway, uh, listener discretion is advised. Well, then go get your bottle of water. <laughs> Damn. I need to. I'm parched. He's hyd- He's got to hydrate. Hydration is important. Hydrate yourself, you beautiful bitch. <laughs> Or listening to the Ink and Pain Club podcast, your weekly home for animation reviews and discussions. Hola, mi amigos. Bienvenido al podcast del Club de Tinta y Pintura. Mi nombre es Matt, y conmigo esta noche es el hombre principal JD. Hola, mi amigos. Y Kyle. I'm not playing this game. También está aquí. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for doing that. That speaks Spanish way better than my white ass, so... I mean, you Google Translate it, too. I don't it even is know from it Google means. Translate. Uh, but yes, uh, as Matt so eloquently put it, this is the Ink and Paint Club podcast, and we talk about cartoons and whatnot. And the reason I had Matt give us such a, a, a rousing intro is because we were talking about a very colorful uh movie uh that i honestly thought we had uh, talked about before but i guess we didn't ever do a formal review for uh but day of the dead uh was last week uh around the halloween time even though they are very separate holidays uh so i don't overlap yeah a little bit um but we are going to be talking about uh coco um from Jesus, a year or two, I don't even know how old Coco is now. It's uh, It came out in 2017. Okay, it's two years ago. That yeah. sounds about right. It's a Pixar movie. It's directed by, uh, not sure how to pronounce his name, actually. Lee Unkrich? Is that Unkrich, how you pronounce it? yeah. It's the guy who yeah. directed Up. He directed, no, I don't think he directed, he directed Toy Story 3, and then he co-directed Toy Story 2, Monsters, Inc., and Finding Nemo. Who the fuck directed Up, then? Uh... Was it him? I don't know. I thought he did. I didn't see that when I went to check on. I think he might have produced on that one. Either way, the ones I mentioned for sure. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, so uh, we're going to talk about Coco today. Um, So before we get started on the actual movie, um, I'm sure if you saw this in the theater uh, originally, uh, you may remember that there was a, a small short um small nothing man that thing was 21 <laughs> fucking minutes it was so yeah and we missed the, out on a freaking for the very first time there was no pixar short before a pixar movie like what the yeah. hell so there was a a very unnecessary uh frozen what <sighs> it's so, like olaf's frozen adventure yeah and i even watching this, it's very obvious that it was meant for TV. Like, the aspect ratio is not even formatted for a, a movie screen. It's formatted for TV. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so I, I'm sure many people, when they went and saw Coco, were very confused by this and, like, the fact that it kept going. Because, uh, you know, it reaches about the seven, eight minute mark. I'm like, all right. You know, short films are really usually wrapped up by this. But it's like, nope, we're only like halfway through. Um, so I, I don't know if I've told this story in the podcast before, but like I was working at a, at a movie theater when Coco came out. And, you know, there was all those stories about like parents coming out complaining. So like, I, I bought a ticket for Coco, not for Frozen 2. And I had to explain it. And I'm like, yeah, but uh, yeah, that totally happened. And uh, I, I had to deal with that. And we had to put up signs warning people that there's this long ass frozen short movie in front of Coco. I was reading that the theaters had to put up signs and stuff. We had yeah, to put I, up guess, signs. I guess it like what took two weeks for the United States to actually just remove it outright. And then like it was gone from the Mexican screenings, like within a few days. Yeah. Cause so many people were complaining about it. Yeah. <laughs> Which honestly it's for the best. Uh, cause you know, Coco could stand on its own. It doesn't need frozen, uh, trying to pull it up. It's and yeah, you're right. It's like the first time we didn't get a Pixar short film in front of a Pixar movie. And it was very strange. It's disappointing. Those are always uh, really good. Yeah. 
But now, you know, I, I, go ahead. No, I was going to say, now, do you guys remember back in 2013 that Disney tried to copyright the phrase Day of the Dead? I sure yeah. do. Like, uh, I guess that was the original title of this movie. And like, I don't know, that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way for good reason, because they thought they were just trying to kind of like in the same way that uh, was it LeBron, Dr- LeBron James tried to copyright the phrase Taco Tuesday recently. But that was mainly <laughs> not not like. I, like he says oh no you know not in general just for this very specific like product whatever thing i'm doing but it's like yeah but when you're trying to copyright stuff that broad man it, it definitely sounds it definitely sends the wrong message well you hell like like you haven't heard the- that, uh, kim kardashian tried to copyright the the word kimono just because it oh had- that's right yeah that too that was uh, earlier this year too you want to get even crazier? I so I live here in Ohio, and Ohio the Ohio State University tried to copyright the word "the." What the hell? Because they're the Ohio State University, so they want to copyright the word "the," <laughs> which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, uh, Ohio is dumb. But um, yeah, so I guess they they withdrew the application because they decided, oh, it's not going to be called Day of the Dead anymore. We're going to call it Coco, and so yeah. And I wonder if that was specifically related to the backlash, if it would have kept its name, if that didn't have that sour reaction to it. Or I don't know. I I like I like Coco as the title for it a lot better than Day of the Dead, because it's like the movie does take place on Day of the Dead. And it's a a lot of it's, you know, but I mean, Coco works a lot better for it because of the story content is related to like, you know, the the family matters and all that related to Coco. Yeah. And I, I, at first, it's kind of confusing. If you don't like know nothing about this movie going in, you may be like wondering, like, why is it called Coco? Um, and even like at the beginning of the movie, when they show Mama Coco, the, the character, I'm like, okay, why is this movie named after her? But I do like how as the as the movie goes on, it like really shows how important she is as a character, and um, you know, then it really makes sense of why the movie is named after her. Yeah. Um, so this movie. I, I even remember saying uh, when uh, I, I was like reading the synopsis for it, even before I went and saw this movie uh, that it has a lot of similar uh, elements that uh, book of life does. And I'm sure a lot of people I, made a comparison. I, I, every, basically anyone who was anyone thought that Coco was just going to be this rip off of book of life after it came out, because I think uh, uh, I'm not sure if the news came out from uh, Jorge Gutierrez himself, but he was saying that, or I'm not sure if he specifically said it, but it was news somewhere that Book of Life was originally pitched to Disney. And then, of course, that movie came out and it was you know popular and stuff. And then we hear about this movie coming out from Disney called Coco. And it's right. Day of the Dead themed and all that. And it's like, yeah, you know, everyone thought it'd be a cheap knockoff and all that. But uh, no, it's it, it shares a lot of uh, similar themes and stuff. But uh, no, they're they're you know totally different movies, and I mean they're both yeah. great movies. Book of Life's great too, but like you know they're yeah. both, they both stand on their own. There's I wouldn't say there's one that's better than the other or anything. They're both great. Right. I I'm, I do I I do like both movies for different reasons. I think I still like Book of Life better, like ever so slightly, but um, I I do think they both stand alone and can stand on their own. And I even I think you even saw Jorge like put out a tweet saying he went and saw it, he loved it, and you're like, he's like, anything that gets more Mexican cultural representation out there yeah, is, yeah. is good. And exactly. I, I kind of agree with that, even though Coco was made by a bunch of white people. Well, yeah, but the, they, well, no, the, it, they, it was, but they also had, like, a bunch of consultants on the movie and stuff. Right, and, right. and I'm not sure if that was specifically related to the backlash, like, from the name thing, but they eventually, like, a lot of the critics that came out and criticized them for that, they actually hired on as consultants for the movie. Mm-hmm. They took, like, multiple, like, I, I didn't rewatch it uh, for the podcast, but I remember when I got the Blu-ray for Coco, there's, like, a bunch of special featurettes about them, like, taking these multiple trips to Mexico and just, like, you know, interviewing, like, all these people and, like, getting all the different, like, you know, locales and or visiting all the different locales and stuff. And like, they, I mean, they did like a lot of research and they did like a lot of really good uh, uh, work related to that. Mm-hmm. Kyle, you were trying to say something. I don't fucking remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's got to get in there, bud. Um, so yeah, Coco's about uh, it's young Miguel wanting to be a uh, be musician, but due to circumstances his family is basically outlawed music 
Um, and on Day of the Dead, he is spirited away to the underworld uh, where he his family and tries to meet with his grandfather, who uh, he thinks is a famous musician, uh, and stuff ensues. Um, <laughs> so I, I do kind of like in one respect over book of life, uh, that Coco actually goes for, um, original music rather than yeah. like Marriott. I do like the mariachi covers in, in book of life, but I, of, I think like, like Mumford and sons and Radiohead and right. <laughs> I, I did like that too, but I do appreciate that this movie's just got like all original music and it's all really good too. Yeah, it's 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 really good, and um, I like that there's even like um, that they. Th- I think like even the original voice actors recorded <laughs> the, the whole Spanish dub of it. I can believe uh, that. Cause I, cause, yeah, because uh, Melanie likes to play. Uh, like I think she, oh, when we were in the car, she has Pandora on, and like um, she has like radio Disney as one of the, her shuffle channels. And occasionally the Coco songs will come on and like, sometimes they're in Spanish, but sometimes they're in English. And it's like, you know, they make just as much, uh, sense in either language. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, uh, it's just a testament to how good, uh, remember me was, I mean, it, you know, of course the Coco was up for best animated and it won because it, it is a Disney movie. They typically win those things. Well, but I mean, see, well, it's a win- it's one of those things too where like it, but i think it was well deserved because i it was a very good movie it wasn't in the same well you know I, I can go off all all day about the, the oscars and animated but <laughs> yeah uh no i definitely agree that um i if i remember right um it did not of- have stiff competition i'll put it that way it I went up what? against it went up against boss baby ferdinand oh. Uh, loving Vincent and the breadwinner, and like those last two, like I would say, were probably the only ones that were like okay. I commercially, I make it com- from a commercial standpoint. Yes, I I'm okay that Coco won. From an artistic standpoint, I was really pulling for Loving Vincent just because I I've never been- saw it, but I was really interested in seeing it. It looked really neat. It it like it's. I think the movie itself is okay like plot wise acting wise all that it's it's fine but just i think from an artistic standpoint the fact that literally every frame of the movie is an oil painting um is an amazing feat and i wish there was it was given more recognition than it did um but you know you're right it, it, between trying to get over boss baby and ferdinand um, as the two major like U.S. releases that it was going up against, um, yeah, um, I'm I'm totally fine that Coco won. But uh, well, anyway, yeah. So the point I was trying to make was that yes, it got it got <laughs> its obligatory uh, Disney Best Animated Award, but also got Best Original Song for Remember Me, which was well deserved because and that whole soundtrack. I kind of want to another like kind of credit to like how well the music was put together that like how that song works just as well as like this big epic sweeping musical number as it does with this like somber, like guitar version uh, that they play at the end of the, at, of the movie. Yeah. Um, and like the, the, with the same lyrics and every and same tune and everything, but like it takes on completely different meaning uh, depending on, on like, who's singing it. Yeah. And just like and the what, level. what, what tone you're singing it with. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I mean the, I, I mean the vi- visually this movie is, I mean it's Pixar, so it's gonna look, uh, great. But I think especially like the design of the Land of the Dead, um, you know the various like skeletons and just their kind of representation of like the whole, um, the Sugar Skull aesthetic. Well, I was gonna say like more of just like uh in the human world where they're like getting ready for day of the dead and just like the decorations and like how everyone's getting ready for it. And just like the colors and everything I think was really, uh, just very well done. And I like that. They're like, they do explain what day of the dead is, but it's not like, 
does it feel like they're lecturing you or it, it, it feels very natural the way they're explaining it? Yeah, that was the one thing that this movie did better than uh, Book of Life because they kind of treated the explanation of uh, Day of the Dead in that one. And from what I remember, like it was like a big old like uh, museum thing that they were kind of expo- doing exposition for. Yeah, but I, I like it how it's like the the grandma is like <clears throat> trying to teach Miguel like the importance of like why why Day of the Dead is important, not so much what it is. Um, and kind of like throwing in the the occasional Spanish phrase for um, to kind of give it some flavor. Um, like I learned what an ofrenda is. <laughs> a little oh. bit stuff. Um, and honestly, like I, I like I obviously I'm a, I'm a very European white boy. Um, hell, I'm not European. I'm American. My family hasn't moved from <laughs> the Ohio, Kentucky area in 200 years. Uh, but I do like the concept of Day of the Dead, just like this. Uh, yeah, it kind of has like a spooky aesthetic, but it's like all about like remembering uh, your your ancestors that come before you. And like this is like the one day of the year that like their spirits can come back and be with you. And you kind of just like it's a, ce- it's a celebration of those people. And I think that's a really uh, interesting way of looking at death. I um, definitely prefer that interpretation of like kind of celebrating life instead of uh kind of just like the way it is everywhere else or like you know you mourn the dead but you know the, like celebrating the dead that's uh, you know it's it's a way better way to approach that i believe that. I've, I've always really dug it for that same uh, sort of reason too mm-hmm. um and i even kind of like how um they kind of because they kind of show that like um Miguel's uh well who is eventually revealed to be Miguel's actual grandfather uh, is in danger of uh succumbing to what they call the final death where it is like when no one in the the human world remembers you you find that's when you finally fade away and become non-existent anymore um which is kind of really depressing uh especially the scene where they actually show you someone going through that yeah, because um, there's like a whole colony in the in the land of the dead where it's like these are just the people that like no one has their picture on the ofrenda anymore. Uh, so they're just kind of waiting to die <laughs> for the second time. Um, so that's really kind of depressing, but I, I think it's handled really well. Um, and even that whole moment with. Um, with his grandfather's name, I'm blanking on. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, Hector, Hector, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Hector sitting with his friend while he's like, he's like playing a song for him before he dies. The um, dirty song that he has to <laughs> dirty <sister>. song, <laughs> which is like, I don't know. It just seemed really appropriate for that. Guy. <laughs> that's the last request for this, for this guy who's dying. Yeah. Uh, so I, th- I just thought that was like kind of a really kind of touching scene. Um, and I mean, if we want to talk touching scenes, um, that whole fucking ending scene where like uh Miguel is like desperately trying to get Coco to remember her dad so he doesn't fade away. Yeah. Just, like like he's, the... he's saying he remembered me to her, uh like on the guitar and stuff, and like she just like starts remembering the song halfway through. Yeah, <laughs> or like she's the, like going senile. The uh like the flashbacks to uh Hector singing it for her too and everything. Like, yeah, no, you definitely I definitely get emotional during those parts. They're very good. Yeah. And like the the whole like let that last scene with with Miguel and, and Coco singing the song. If you don't like tear up a little bit, I don't think you're human. <laughs> <laughs> uh Kyle, you've been quiet over there. What do what what do you think about this movie? I liked the candle lady. And how she Wrong movie, it. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I like this movie somewhat. It was all right. It wasn't the best movie, but I think it falls under the whole Disney bullshit that they've been doing lately with the uh, twist villains. And they're, they beat the whole M Night Shyamalan. Or, oh no, the sheep was the bad guy all along. 
they keep doing stuff like uh, that. Yeah, I, yeah, because it did come out around the, the around a time where Disney was doing that with like a lot of the movies. They did it with Frozen. They did it with uh, Coco. They did it with some other ones too. I'm kind of blanking on at the moment, but it seemed like they were doing it like yeah a lot. So that is a genuine criticism. Big Hero Six. Big Hero Six. That was yeah. That was the other one I was trying to remember. What a well, bug. I, I, I do kind of agree that yeah it is kind of like kind of in line with their their twist villain kind of trope but i think it really kind of works well here it works here the best out of any of those examples for sure like just the the way that they explain the whole thing about like yeah ernesto de la cruz like stealing hector's songs because he you know poisoned him and killed him and then went on to become this popular sensation in life and even more popular in death like yeah he got it, popular it, off of all of hector's songs but he yeah. couldn't do anything about it because he did and uh isn't that revealed as the main character is kind of hanging out with him thinking he's his grandpa he kind of uh, i mean they well, kind yeah, of well, they kind miguel, of allude because miguel's with him and then um like he had like ernesto has like one of his old movies playing up the wall and it's like basically that scene um of him getting poisoned yeah right but, uh, like but, miguel but, I mean, even pieces, before that even before that, they're dropping. Like, they were dropping hints that there was some sort of connection there, because basically the very first scene that you see Hector and he's trying to uh, pass him off, to pass himself off as a Frida Kahlo, and uh, <laughs> and he's like, you know, okay, I apologize for that, but uh, you want to get into Ernesto's uh, party, you know, I'm good friends with them, and like he's talking about how he hates musicians, but then they show him like he's actually very well, he, you know, plays guitar and he sings and all that, so. Uh, there's still they do plant some seeds there where you can kind of like you know make the connection before they actually do bring it up it's not just like freaking uh at the drop of a hat like uh the frozens or something Mm -hmm. and i kind of do i kind of want to give credit to the uh the marketing uh for this because like in all all the marketing for coco they have both hector and Ernesto just looking like nice and friendly, like no hint that like, Oh, Ernesto is going to be the bad guy. Uh, I mean, they, that's, they kind of played that pretty close until you actually see the movie. Yeah. That's what a twist villain is. I mean, King candy. Did you know that was turbo at the end? I mean, come on now. That was the other example. I was trying to, remember. that was the first one. That was like the first big one they did, huh? Yeah. It's just Jesus, man. Give it a rest. No, but like if they're building it up, like I said, in Frozen, it just happens. But at least in like Wreck It Ralph and Coco, like they are dropping stuff there where like when it happens, you're like, oh, okay. You're thinking back to stuff where, you know, it, you know, where it has like little builds and stuff. You're thinking, okay, well, then yeah, that makes sense. But like in like Frozen's case, yeah, it's just, it, I don't remember. It's been a bit since I watched it, but I remember watching it like when it came out. I'm just thinking, like, what? What the hell? Like, and was originally supposed to have Elsa as the main bad guy, and then they wrote themselves back when it was uh, the Snow Queen. Yeah, yeah, they wrote themselves in a corner, and that was like just like the laziest ending, from what I understand. To do was just like a guy that never showed any signs of evil is now evil. Yeah, Han- Hans's thing was kind of like out of nowhere. I, I've uh, never watched the movie, but I I have heard from people. Um, I don't know. I liked like the colors and stuff from this movie. I would say that I like this movie actually better than Book of Life, um, which is a little weird to say, because usually I go for the more indie stuff than the fucking mainstream thing. But um, that was really cool. I like the whole bridge with what is it? All the flower petals pretty neat the dog the cat whatever the fuck the lion the uh um, all the design was really yeah, great. The, 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 the alabrije alabrije that's what it was those thingies yeah those were neat uh dante was uh, one of my favorite characters in the movie <laughs> he just i don't know they got the texture right on him and everything he just like this weird <laughs> this weird fucking dog it, it, that's just... it, 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 and that was like kind of one of those things. Where like I had no idea that was a bre- an actual breed of dog. It is. It's I like did. I I'd seen it before, man. They're crazy. Yeah, it starts with an X. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, they're like weird, like rat dogs or whatever. Yeah, they're rat hairless dog. and they're gross looking, but <laughs> you know. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think I think saying this like I wouldn't fault anyone for saying that like Coco they like Coco over Book of Life or Book of Life over Coco because again th- I think both movies stand on their own just perfectly fine. I think they honestly kind of complement each other because I think if you were to watch both of them, you know, around uh, Halloween Day of the Dead, I think that would I, I think that would make for a good double feature. Kind of just give two slightly different perspectives on the same holiday. Like how, like how, you know, everyone watches Christmas movies. How much, how many ways can you really interpret Christmas? But God damn, is there a million fucking Christmas movies? Yeah, there but sure see, is. I, I don't know. Christmas is more of a broad thing where people are spending time with their family and doing wacky shenanigans with a day of the dead movie. It seems like you can only do so much because it's always going to end up going to the land of the dead and, doing all this kind of stuff it seems kind of more limited as a holiday well well at least we have two movies about it so and they're both very good i mean like if if they announced another day of the dead movie would you guys be like oh that's a little weird like if if another like major studio said hey we're doing a day of the dead movie i'd be like okay well what's your what's your spin on it yeah, as long as it's not too similar to these, you know, other two, and they're, you know, done competently. Yeah, I'd definitely be down to see it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it would be the same. Oh, I'm going to the underworld. I'm going to meet my dead ancestors. <laughs> you, you know what, though, even if it was, I mean, I, I'm always down for anything that kind of deals with going to hell or the land of the dead or the underworld mm-hmm. or anything. I'm always a sucker for those types of movies. So even if it was sort of like a retread, I'd probably still see it too. I mean, didn't they do a whole LT Gray episode based on that, where he meets his own his uh, ancestors? They're all Probably. super. Good. Though I, I do just kind of, kind of in a similar vein. I, I kind of just remembered that uh, Book of Life and um, um, and and Coco kind of have two different interpretations of the afterlife. Because I, I seem to remember in Book of Life, they have the afterlife in like three separate areas, whereas Coco has it all in one. Um, well, two, if you want to say the place where people are forgotten. Well, I thought they had like a middle area and then they had like the land of the remember. Um, and then it's just like regular land of the dead. Um Whereas Coco has like the land of the dead is just one big area. And it's like they they have the slums where people are being forgotten, but then there's like everyone else lives in the other area. That's what I mean. Wouldn't Coco just be two areas then if it was one? I, for well, I guess, well, I guess what he's trying to say is that it's not like two different, it's not like different planes of existence. Right, it's just sort like, of like in real life, how there's, you know, highly populated areas and then there's like slums, but it's not like, you know, this is heaven and hell or it's something. What, like Coco has it all in one realm where it's split it up into three realms. Yeah. Like you need some kind of power to go to, to a different level of the afterlife. Um, that sounds familiar. It's been a bit since I watched a uh, book of life, but that yeah, I need to rewatch it again. Yeah, I almost did uh, when I rewatched Coco too, just to have like a good sort of a uh, uh, back and you know back to back like un- re understanding of the movies. But uh, mm. I didn't get around to doing that. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think if if you haven't watched Coco by now, I think you definitely should. Um, if you're listening to this when this episode comes out, it's only going to be on Netflix till the end of the month, so. And then it'll probably move to Disney Plus when that comes out. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the, it's, I, I think it's definitely worth a watch. Um, if you're kind of even have a passing uh, interest in like what Day of the Dead is about and, uh, you know, just all that kind of that, that whole kind of culture and stuff. I, I think Coco really kind of represents it well. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't watched Coco, watch it because it's a good movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's Disney, and it's, you know, kind of overshadows the the lesser known Day of the Dead movie. But you know, watch them both. I, I think I think there's room for two Day of the Dead movies. Why not? But not three. Yeah, three's pushing it. <laughs> Can't have that much representation. Come in, come on. Do it live action. Don't make an animated. <laughs> 
We'll do. We'll, we'll make a compromise. We'll do a live action CG hybrid. Those yeah. always work out. I guess. <laughs> well, is there anything else you guys want to say before we wrap up tonight? Uh, I would just say uh, seize your moment and go watch this movie. There you go. Yeah. I don't know, JD. Do you have any closing thoughts that you ran through Google Translate? <laughs> um, you give me a minute. I can probably come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be inclusive. Um, all right. Well, there you go, guys. There's our thoughts on Coco. Uh, let us know in the comments what you thought of this, and uh, you know if you wh- which which of the Day of the Dead animated films you prefer. Um, there you go. Um, well, thanks for listening, and thank you both for being here. And to everyone out there, we will see you again next week. Adios. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Ink and Pink Club podcast. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the show. Join our Discord to chat with us and subscribe to our Patreon for some cool bonuses. Links are in the description. We'll see you next time.